Ah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, I was, um, I was listening to the words of that song, and it says, when I open my mouth, what does it say, miracles? Miracles start breaking out. Then you reminded, I have the authority. You know what? And I just wondered. I want. It says, it says, it says when I open up my mouth, miracles start breaking out. And I just thought to myself, what would the room sound like if we believed that was true? Oh, you missed it. Let me give that to you again. Let me give it to you again. I said, hold on, hold on. You missed it. Let me help you. Let me help you out. If every time I open my mouth, miracles started breaking out. Well, you know what? Hold on. Maybe it's a room full of people where nobody needs a miracle. But if you need God to do something in your life, I'm telling you he inhabits the praises of his people. What that means is when you say something, it means something in heaven. And I wonder if we just took 30 seconds to say something in here, to declare his glory, to lift up his praise, to lift up his wonder, to lift up his glory. If we just opened our mouth, miracles, miracles, miracles. Anybody need a miracle this morning? Anybody need a breakthrough? Anybody need God? you to open up your mouth and say I have the authority come on Midtown come on Midtown one more time lift your voice and sing when I open my mouth when I open up my mouth So God, we stand in your authority as we open up your word. Your word has authority. We're just not up in here listening to stories and singing songs. We are standing on the power of the authority of the almighty God. The same word that said, let there be light and there was light. The same word that created the heavens and the earth. It is that word that we stand on. It is that word that we believe in. It is that word that we say, Lord. It is that word that we say, Lord. Speak over our families. Speak over our babies. Speak over our finances. Father, there's someone in this room right now that needs a financial breakthrough. Father, would you move by your spirit in the name of Jesus? We believe that miracles can happen today. So, Father, those same words, your children have now gathered to listen. Speak, O oh Lord. Tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. God, it's to that end that I ask now that you stand in my body. Think through my mind. Speak through my vocal cords. Those things you would have us say, no and do. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. Oh Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, everybody made a sound that declared his glory in the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Would you thank God for this amazing worship team just leading us? I, I got to tell Bob and Ephraim, man, you can't. They got this clock back there. I only got 25 minutes. Now, that whole prayer singing team, that was the worship time. That wasn't my time. Don't take that from the preaching, the preaching clock. My clock don't start until I read the, the passage. So, y'all, so don't. Don't put the clock on me yet. 
Yeah, y'all saying that. Yeah, it'll be like, you can preach as long as you want. We leaving at, at, at 11.15. I don't care what you say. We, we out. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. We're going to re begin reading at verse 11. Luke chapter 7. We'll begin reading at verse 7. Hear these words of our Father. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him, and he approached the town gate, uh, and a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. The large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe. Everybody say awe. And praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. The news went about. Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Start the clock now. <laughs> We've been in a series, Who Am I? Who Am I? Um, who, who am I in Christ? Finding our identity in Christ. Finding our identity in Christ. You know, I, over the last year doing COVID, I, um, I discovered one of the strategies of how Satan desires to attempt identity theft in my life how he wants to rob me of my identity in Christ. <laughs> I discovered how, the, how Satan wants to use strategy in my life, uh, which is a new thing for me. I, I've been very gifted in past seasons of being able to identify straight Satan's strategies in other people's life, um, uh, particularly my wife. I could see Satan's strategy in her all the time. I be talking, I can see, I can see how the devil is moving in you right now. I could see his strategy. Well, uh, after some marriage counseling, I've been advised that that's not a gift. Um, it's, it's, it's actually a liability. It's something I need to work on. So I've, 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 I've now worked on seeing Satan move in my own life. Who knew that was a thing? Turns out it is. So, and I recognize that when I struggle, I struggle most with my identity with, in Christ. I, I struggle the most with where I am in Christ um, when I struggle with remembering who Christ is. I struggle with who I am when I struggle to remember who he is. In other words, our, effective, our effectiveness of being able to stay anchored in who we are in Christ is remembering simply who Christ is. And I found myself under the attack of my struggle in identity is when Satan can get me to not remember and not walk in what I know of who Christ is. And I am most susceptible to that in storms, in struggle, in hard times. It's in hard times where I struggle the most to remember who God is because I tend to focus more on my crisis than I do my Christ. So today, in the 19 minutes, 57 seconds that I have left, 51, 50, 49, um, I just want to remind you of who Christ is. So in him, you might remember who you are. Our text reveals a woman who's right in the throes 
of what it is to be in a crisis. She's in trouble. She's in trouble. Um, the text shows us that she's walking behind the corpse of what will be revealed to be her, her only son. So not only has she lost her baby, but he's the only one she had. She's in trouble. The text will then also reveal not only is she walking behind the body of her dead son, her only son, but the text says that she's a widow, which means she's been here before. This isn't the first time she's had to make this walk. Her heart has been broken into pieces, now broken yet again. Not only that, but she's in financial trouble. You see, with no husband, with no son, she's a widow. And culturally during that time, it's a reason why God takes extra effort to call out and says, if you don't do nothing else, make sure you take care of the orphan and the widow. Because culturally now she's, she's, she's financially dependent upon the charity of others. She has no means of income. So she's not just experiencing the loss of a son, the loss of a father, but the loss of economic stability. This woman is in trouble. So she's walking in this funeral procession and, and, and she's carrying the weight of recognizing that her life will never be the same. Her heart is broken and she doesn't know where her next meal will be coming from. And that's when Jesus intercepts the, this, the procession. So Jesus comes, sees the woman, sees the dead boy, and walks up to her, and I struggle with his words. I know as a pastor, I shouldn't struggle with words of Jesus, but I struggle with his words because what he says to this woman just seems off. It, it seems as if he didn't read the room right. It seems as if he's missing a moment. It seems as if he just says the inappropriate thing. You know, kind of like that cousin that comes over for Thanksgiving and always going to say something inappropriate. That's, it feels like, Jesus, this is the inappropriate thing to say. Like, why are you saying this? But, you know, I got to be careful. You can't question Jesus too much because he's Old Testament Jesus and he could kill you. So... <laughs> So I don't want to cross the Old Testament line and bring about his wrath and I die and turn to ash on stage. However, he comes up to the woman, see it. I told y'all, this woman has a broken heart. She has a broken economic status. She, 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 she's broken in every way. And Jesus comes up to her and out of all the words in the lexicon, he chooses these two words. He looks at the woman and he says, don't cry like if anybody's got a reason to cry it's this woman and it triggers me a little bit it triggers me because church people you know sometimes y'all can get on my nerves you know that yeah I know you know, yeah, sometimes you get on my nerves because we don't, we don't know how to let people suffer. We don't know how to let people grieve. We're so uncomfortable with letting people be undone. We think everything got to be all good and all fixed and I'm too blessed to be stressed. No, I'm blessed, but I'm also stressed as that. Well, whoo, Lord. I'm, like, like, like oh, don't worry about it. No, I got to worry about it. I don't know where I'm at. I'm going to pay rent this month. You, you mean don't worry about it. And I'm walking around and you say, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and hollish. Shut up. You, you cried yourself to sleep last night. All hell breaking out loose in your life. If that's blessed and highly favored, I don't want it. Like, we don't know how to just let people be. There's sometimes, I know I shouldn't say this. I might not be invited, but there's sometimes when I just don't feel like praying. Oh, I'm the only one. Okay, never mind. That's all right. That's all right. Bob will be back next week. That sometimes I don't want scriptures. And I'm a pastor. I get paid to be holy. A part of my job description is be holy. But there's sometimes when it's just broken. And it's okay with Jesus just to sit in the brokenness 
We so quick to get out the ashes, we gonna cut short the beauty because the, the ashes are required for the beauty. The ashes are required for the beauty. So sometimes we as Christians, we don't know how it is to just let stuff be broke and just to sit and lament and to cry with one another. That's why it's confusing, Jesus. I'm tripping right now because, because you know better, Jesus. Like, you know. So he goes to this woman and says, don't cry. Interestingly enough, the Bible is not written in English. Originally, it was written in a language called Greek. And the word that he uses there for don't cry is Clio, Clio, Clio. Now, as you unpack the word Clio, it actually does not mean don't allow tears to stream down your face. It's not about what it means by don't cry. Clio, it's a word, it's an interesting word. It's the idea of one wailing at a pitch of despair. One, uh, one crying with a tone of hopelessness. Uh, it, it is the well, it is a sound of one who has given up. So when Jesus walks to this woman and seeing clearly her burden and her struggle, see clearly the devastation of her situation, he walks to her and he says, watch this, he doesn't say, don't allow tears to stream down your face. That's not what he means by don't cry. He goes up to her and he says, don't cry, yo. Don't cry as though there is no hope. Don't wail as though there is no despair. Don't wail as if it is over. I've come to talk to somebody today who's discouraged. If you found your way in this service or if you're watching and you found your way in this room and you're discouraged and the enemy, I want to talk to four people that the enemy has been lying to and you've been thinking about giving up. You've been thinking about throwing in the towel. You've been coming up with every reason why you shouldn't keep going. Or you've been thinking about all the people that gave up on you, all the people that walked out on you. You've been wrestling with your worth, wondering if you're even worth it, if you're even valuable. Well, I have come all the way on an hour and 15 flight from Los Angeles, L.A with no traffic hallelujah speak in tongues thank you Jesus just to encourage you and to give you this word from the Lord God has not brought you this far to leave you now is not the time for giving up now is not the time for throwing in the towel lift your head up stick your chest out if you still got breath in your body you still got purpose in your chest I've come to tell somebody don't Clio don't quit don't throw in the towel God is not through with you yet. If you believe that, take 15 seconds and give God a I'm not going to quit praise. Give God a I'm not going to throw in the towel shout because he's not through with you yet. I don't care how bad it looks. Don't Clio. Don't you quit. I want to speak to the marriage where y'all been talking about separating. You've been talking about divorce lawyers. I'm telling you, don't Clio. Don't you quit. Don't, you need to call somebody. Call a therapist. Call a counseling. Call three. One for you, one for him, and one for them. For all y'all. Y'all go, all go, go put in the work. But don't you quit. Don't let you, this quarantine take you out. It was a rough year. Y'all ain't never spent that much time together before. This year, take some breaks from one another. Y'all gonna be all right. Get the help you need. Come on, can I get a married and quarantine witness up in here? I'm not going to finish this sermon. Y'all going to have to come back to the next service. It's, I, I'm down to 10 minutes. But I, I'm just telling you, y'all, me and my wife, we was quarantined together, child. I was glad when they opened back up. I was like, babe, I'm getting on the road again. I'm going. Turns out there was some benefits to me traveling. I wasn't in her way. And she wasn't in mine. Hallelujah. Glory. Now, nah, can I just encourage somebody, though, seriously? Get help. Don't get out. Get help. Get help. If it's abusive and toxic, that's a different story. We got great pastoral team here, great counseling. If you're confused at where you are, set up an appointment. Meet this week. But don't quit. I come to encourage somebody. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Why, Albert? Why? Why should I not quit? Second point is because God says, I see you. He says to the woman, he says, I see you. I see you. I see you. Um, <laughs> I'm from Mississippi. So I'm, I'm a Southern boy, born and bred. Uh, 
through and through. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you, when, um, and it sounds weird and morbid, but you, you just got to trust me. Uh, you don't want to die and go to heaven without go, going to one of our funerals. Yeah. No, no, no. Not our funerals. Our funerals. Yeah, I'm not getting I'm trying to say it without saying it. Um, our funerals. Can I tell you? I'm just telling you, a black funeral is one of the most memorable experiences of a lifetime, especially in the South. I'm sure, I'm sure it migrated because some of us moved up to Sacramento, so I'm sure y'all, y'all got to hang up. But I'm just telling you, you just don't want to die and go to heaven without going to someone's funeral who's died and going to heaven that's black. Um, it is, um, I mean, you laugh, you cry, you shout, you dance, you have security. Because it's, it's always that uncle that Lord have mercy, if he get to the mic, Aunt Mildred is going to get up out the casket and be like, have y'all lost y'all mind with let him speak at my funeral? You're going to have all of it. Now, before you go running out there with my, my white brothers and sisters, before y'all go run into a black funeral, let me just warn you, it could go from 10 to 8 hours. Uh, so you got to be praying. If you don't believe me, ask Aretha or Whitney. They'll tell you. He will go a long time, but don't worry, there's recess. Um, there, there, there are snacks, there are refreshments. No, 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 no. It's not outside at the bar. It's in the black mama's purse, and she just passing out stuff out her purse. Capri Suns, Cheez-Its, Cheetos, juice boxes. You just, you just got to get on the right road with the right mama, and she'll have all, all you need. <laughs> I, I, I guess what I want to say is, as, as, as much as going on in a black funeral, it pales in comparison to a historic Jewish funeral. At a Jewish funeral, Jewish funeral, it goes for multiple days. It's somebody's job to actually mourn at your funeral. It's a job. Can you imagine? How do you get that job? Uh, interviews, uh, regular cries, two o'clock, ugly cries, four, four thirty, and five o'clock interviews. Like, how do you get that job? Like they, but they, it's their job to come and just cry in the mourn at the loss of your loved one. Not only that, but they have special music, special instrumentation. There's a band. Most historians would say it's something like a cymbal and like a flute, which does not sound together good together at all. So you got this raggedy sound in music, these people that's paid to cry, people all around you, and you got the body. This woman's got all of that going on, but Jesus says to her, I see you. You got a lot going on around you, but I still see you. Some of you, you got a lot going on around you. And I'm telling you, Jesus says, I still see you. Some of you, you've even said it in your prayer journal this week. I just wonder if anybody even sees me. I wonder if it matters to anybody. You got the kids going on around you. You got the financial crisis. Some of you dealing with some health stuff. You got your, your in-laws. You got your grandkids. Some of you trying to navigate singleness. You got your ex trying to, trying to hit you up. You got a lot of stuff going on around you. And God says, in the midst of all you got going around you, other people may not see you. Your kids may not see you. Your spouse may not see you. Your parents may not see you. But I see you. I see you right where you are. And what I love about Jesus is not only do I see you, watch this, but I'm drawn to the mess that I see. Because some of us think we got, we got so much going on in the stuff that we do got going on, we ain't proud of, it's a mess, it's all that. So we got all that. So it's like Jesus, I don't even, even if you saw it, you'd probably run from it. And God says, I'm not like your bad friends. Some, I don't know about y'all, but I got bad friends. I'll be there to serve them and be there for them, but as soon as I need something, they are allergic. They have an allergic reaction to my need. They start sneezing when I have to ask for something. They start, it's like I'm allergic to your needs. Jesus says, I'm not a bad friend. Not only do I, do I see you, but I, it's kind of like that. It's an interesting word there. Um, the word see you is blepo. It's blepo. Uh, it's the idea, I see, I see that beautiful uh, tie you got on your head. That's cute, girl. Um, I see... I see that shirt you got on. I see that, that plaid uh, shirt you got on. I see, see the lady in the back nodding, trying to fight sleep. I see that. I see those things. 
That, that's the idea of blepo, I see you. But that's not the word Jesus uses there. He doesn't use the word blepo, he uses the word iodine, iodine, which doesn't mean I see you, I see that shirt. It, it, it's better translated, I see in you. I see what's really going on inside of you. I see the burden that you carry that no one else sees. I see the anxiety that you carry that you can't express to anybody else because you're the fixer in the house. You're the strong one in the house. So if they knew that you were struggling or scared, they'd freak out. So you got to keep it together so you can keep them together. And he says, while you got a good armor on and you can fool everybody else, you can't fool me. I can see your struggle. I see in you. So the, and, and, and it's freeing. Because he just says, I don't see the facade, but I can see, here it is, I can see beyond the mask. Yeah, I can see beyond the mask. And some of you, you've been covering up the mask more than just the physical mask. You've been walking around with an emotional, spiritual mask for a long time. And he says, you, you fooled a lot of people, but you haven't fooled your God. I see you. Here's the good news. I'm drawn to you. I'm not repelled by you. It, it, it's like this. Um, there was a guy, his family was asking, begging him to go into Alcoholics Anonymous. But he refused to go. He ends up at a, at a conference where an uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous ambassador is speaking. Phenomenal job, moves the room to their feet. When he gets done, the guy comes up to him and says, hey, my family's been trying to get me to go to AA Alcoholics Anonymous. They say you got the best program. Tell me why. Why, why is your program better than everyone else? He says, when an alcoholic hits rock bottom, he's in the ditch of his life. She's in the ditch of her life. And when you're in the ditch of your life, people just come by and they just throw you a rope. They throw you a rope of money and say, here's, they throw you a rope of books to read. Here's some resources. Some even throw you a rope of prayer and say, here, pray these prayers and you'll get better. He says, well, at Alcoholics Anonymous, we know that when you're in the ditch of your life, you don't need another rope. It's not, so we don't throw you a rope. We, throw, we pull the rope out. He says, what do y'all do? He says, well, when you're in the ditch of your life, we jump down in the ditch with you. And then he says, well, now we both in the ditch. Now, how, how is that helpful? He says, well, we're both in the ditch. But I've been here before, and I know the way out. Know the way out. Friends, I'm telling you, right where you are, Jesus says, I'm the kind of God, I didn't come to throw you a rope in your situation. I've come, I put on flesh, I got down in the ditch with you, and I'm telling you, trust me, I know the way out. I see you. I'm drawn to you. And I've come to bring you out. Some of you, you need to know Jesus is getting down the ditch with you. Your sin hasn't disqualified you from his presence. Your failures in this season hasn't disqualified you from his love. You choosing to self-medicate with things outside of his promise and his pleasure and his purpose for your life hasn't disqualified you from his plan. He's in the ditch with you. Trust him. Let him lead you out. Somebody needs to come out of the ditch today. 